Hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me? Is that a yes. yes or no? Okay, good. <laughs> we have a little bit of technical difficulty. First time ever we're getting it going, but we're really excited. Welcome to SLAM 2010, the 14th edition of SLAM here at Marceau University. Hope you can all hear me. If anybody has any trouble, please put it in the chat. We'll try to address any issues. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are really, really excited about this venture that we're going into with the first virtual digital version of SLAM. But the first thing I want to do is make sure you understand how everybody came together to make this happen. So I want to thank all of the people who participated. We have the SLAM committee itself, Amanda Knapp, Greg Clemens, Brett Johnson, Misty Tyson, Ryan Bell, Sakina Richardson, our student members, Faj Bradford and Ryan Davis, and most especially Ted Brunner in our IT department and Mike Thornhill, who has done yeoman's work for this to make this thing come about technologically. It's working. I hope you're hearing it. We've got it going and we're excited about it. None of this would have happened without all of these people working together. Additionally, we want to thank the students in Professor Ken Katara's art class for the slam posters that they contributed this year. And for the second year in a row, the program design cover winner, Emily Burris. Congratulations, Emily. Wonderful job. All right. Finally, we want to thank all of our student presenters, the ones that came together, helped make this work, and all of you for joining us today. So far, we're up to 155 participants. That's exciting. Let's keep that number going. All right. We have a great, great program for you today. So let's begin with one of our SLAM student committee representatives, Ryan Davis, as he starts us off and leads us in prayer. Hey, everyone. I ask that you um, close your eyes and bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this time of celebration of students' hard work and their accomplishments, God. I ask that their words from the presentations and the speaker inspire and encourage everyone and resonate in their hearts and just touch their hearts, Lord God, and give them a break from their daily lives. And God, I ask that you give us covering and protection and just peace and comfort during this pandemic, Lord God. And for those who are sick, I pray for a quick recovery. I ask that their lives just come back even better and they come back stronger, Lord God. And I ask that you just remind us that even during all this chaos and craziness going on in the world, that you're still in control and you're still more than capable for caring for us. All these things I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. We really appreciate that. And we all do join you in prayer for all those uh, suffering from COVID-19 and all the things associated with that. All right, now let's hear from our president, Tony Floyd. Good morning. This has been unbelievable. Thank you for putting together one of the first decisions I was asked to make a call on when the disruption occurred was, what about SLAM? I said, shoot, yeah, we're gonna do SLAM somehow, some way. And we're seeing today incredible work. So thank you for everybody who's done that. Hey, Lions, I just want to tell you, uh, we really miss y'all. I've got things under control here, looking out at Bailey Mountain up a window, and the groundhogs are out here on the amphitheater. They miss you. Um, the campus has sprung to life with beauty. The flowers are blooming. Uh, Bailey Mountain's turning green. The trees are exploding. There's a little bit of pollen. It's, but it's beautiful. We miss you guys. Um, unbelievable to, to be here without you. Y'all, this was a great day to celebrate our um, liberal arts mosaic. And I'm so proud of the students who will be presenting. I'm so proud of everybody who's gotten up and signed on today to be a part of this. So I just want to tell you, welcome. We miss you. I can't wait to get you back. When you come back in the fall, we're going to make up for lost time. It's going to be, it's, we're going to have a good time and get a lot done. So um, just want to say welcome and thank you for, I'll be in and out today. I got some meetings during the day on, on Zoom. I'll be popping in and out to watch the presentation. So good luck and have a great day.
keep it coming. Um, this is being recorded, so it will be posted on the SLAM site along with all the presentations that are already there, okay? Those student presentations are pre-recorded. They're not live yet, but they will be live by the end of this live presentation. By two o'clock this afternoon, the speaker and this recorded version of everything that was live will be on that site as well. So you'll have access to the speaker and to all of the student presentations that are already there. Okay, we have 23 oral presentations and multiple arts breaks, and they're all really, really good. So you're gonna really um, enjoy those. The SLAM program is, the program itself is on the Spring SLAM website. You can read through the program and read the abstracts. You can check that out. My recommendation is read through the program, see what sounds interesting, and go check out the ones that you like. I mean, I would really check them all out. They're all really good. But look at the ones you like and see what you're going to do, okay? Now, I say that because we do have student incentives again this year, just like we've had in past years, okay? To get your name in a drawing for a student incentive, you do have to view the speaker and three other student presentations, okay? So, you choose the ones you want to watch. After two o'clock this afternoon, the speaker's recording will be on. All the other pre-recorded student videos are already there. So you can go view anything you want, have a total of four or more. But once you have four, you go to the Spring Slam site. There's a jot form on there, super short. There's a drop-down menus that, that give you even choices of the uh, presentation so you don't have to type anything in uh, there. Then go on down and just respond to each of the videos that you saw. Really simple, really easy. Shouldn't take five minutes to do all of the presentations that you view, okay? So you can win incentives. The incentives this year will be sent out over the summer. You won't have to wait the fall get them to get them back. We're working on that right now. We probably won't send those out till after May 15th because we'll have to pull all our numbers together, gather all the data information about who did what, when, where, why, and then we'll make sure we have those drawings arbitrarily, of course, do a number generator, and then uh, be able to send those things out to you. So we're really looking forward to it. If you have any questions about anything that happens today, feel free to contact any of the SLAM committee members, including myself, and let us know what you might have. Look at the Spring SLAM site before you do anything. It's very simple. You can go through the program and click on the title of the presenter and it'll take you to the, per the presentation, or you can literally drop down below that and click on the person's name and face and the presentation pops up. So super easy, super simple. Wonderful job making it happen. Okay, now in just a minute, our speaker is going to get started. You're really going to enjoy, enjoy his presentation. He's a wonderful speaker and performer, so we're really looking forward to that. At the end, we will have time for a question and answer session. So throughout his presentation, if you are interested in asking a question, put that in the chat, and we'll keep track of the questions here in the chat, and at the end, we'll try to consolidate those questions and give him an opportunity to respond to those. Now remember, anything you put in the chat, we can all see. So, you know, be smart about what you put in the chat and ask good questions, okay? All right, so now another of our student SLAM representatives will be introducing our speaker. Please welcome Taj Bradford. Good morning, Marcel. Um, today we have a very special guest speaker. Um, you may recognize him from his previous performances at Mars Hill, um, Mr. Ed Mabry. Um, Ed Mabry is a native of Dayton, Ohio. He currently resides in LA. Um, he is an accomplished spoken word artist, poet, motivational speaker, comedian, actor, and entrepreneur. Um, he has done many performances at uh, several colleges, including Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, and uh, Mars Hill. Uh, he also has several TV appearances from TEDx to Fox. Um, he is a Pushcart nominee. Emmy nominee, and he is considered to be one of the most important um, literary voices to come out of Ohio. Um, please welcome Ed Mabry. Hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Ed Mabry, and I would like to start this off uh, quite simply um, by saying that uh, we are in interesting times, and it would be uh, foolish of me to not actually discuss part of that uh, while we're in these times. So uh, this year is a little different than most years with SLAM uh, in terms of the conversation, uh, the keynote speech, me, uh, everything that's going on. Um, so I want to make sure that we actually kind of cover that in addition to uh, just sharing who I am and my journey. 
Uh, so we're discussing how a person comes to be where they are and the unique paths or forging a path that did not previously exist before you yourself started doing it. Uh, so typically the first question I get uh, is what in the world do I do? And when you tell someone that you are a professional poet, uh, the next question normally is, okay, seriously, what do you do? Uh, how do you do it? Uh, what exactly is a professional poet? It sounds very much like slang uh, for you are delivering pizzas and maybe go to the occasional coffee house and share some very bad poetry and somebody once upon a time put a dollar in a hat and now magically here you are. Uh, but what a professional poet is, is a very different journey. And my journey uh, has always been surrounded by a variety of, uh, of pandemics, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, I'm a 70s baby. And in that particular year, uh, I did some research and discovered uh, that uh, there was the wonderful London flu. Uh, so I came in early 70s with the London flu. So I was already an international child and didn't realize it. I was already thinking of peace and love in my mother's womb. Uh, we moved forward. And like anyone else, I decided that I wanted to do something foolish like fall in love. And in turn, uh, the best way to impress this young lady was to write her a poem. Uh, so I wrote her a poem and the poem was very simple. It was a note and the note was passed and the note said, will you be my girlfriend? Check one box, yes or no. Uh, I waited uh, all day long and I waited and waited and waited. And finally at the final class, I received the note back uh, from someone else who I didn't even give it to in the first place. One of her, uh, her fellow soldiers in the fight for love. And I opened it up and the desk box was not checked. The no box was not checked. <laughs> Instead written in highlight purple glitter, uh, as was the thing at the time. Uh, there was something written at the bottom that said, maybe, maybe. Uh, today, we're going to talk about maybe. It's a weird thing to hear a speaker discuss. Uh, 1971, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I was born to a woman who had been the victim of domestic violence uh, by the man that she had chosen to marry, the first man she had ever fell in love with the first man she had ever uh, laid down with, uh, decided that he uh, didn't care for the way things were. Um, alcoholism was and still is rampant a thing, uh, moving through Cincinnati, Ohio in the summertime. I received uh, these wonderful markings on my face, uh, the lovely dark skin patches uh, that are darker than other parts of me, uh, due to that same woman uh, walking to her new job in the summertime, because I was born in July and having no babysitter and my father being passed out at home. So she has to walk and carry me in a back sack. Uh, my head tilts back for the entire walk, uh, unbeknownst to her, uh, no fault of hers at all. And by the time she gets to work on her first day at her new job at a hospital that I had just been born in, uh, they discover that I have uh, third degree burns over most of my face uh, my skin is tight and tough enough to where it feels like leather. Uh, the nurse said that when they touched it, it actually was so hot when they pulled, the skin came back with it. So, uh, and you say, well, Ed, what in the world does that have to do with being a professional poet? Uh, I understood at a very early age what it meant to be marked. Uh, I understood the need to appreciate the skin I was in uh, because I was not guaranteed to keep it. I understood that my actual skin, my tone, uh, could be perceived as a bad thing. Uh, but through this entire time, my mother worked and she took care of me and she did what she could to heal my skin without plastic surgery. And here I am, uh, all the better for it. Uh, I learned quickly that uh, men and human beings, period, uh, should never put their hands on anyone. I learned quickly the effects of not dealing with early hood trauma. Uh, I learned the idea of forgiveness. Um, I learned that that great maybe is always there. And the maybe was, in this case, maybe things would be better. And they were. Uh, we move forward. And now I'm in elementary school. And there are ridiculous things moving through. We have smallpox. Uh, we go into junior high school. And the HIV AIDS pandemic is sweeping through America. Uh, people are wondering exactly what to do. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. 
There's a lot of phobias and a lot of bigotry. A lot of people are exposing themselves, not necessarily as being bad people, but definitely as being confused, as being misunderstood, as being ignorant as to what was going on and not really in touch with their fellow man. Uh, at this point, I'm now in junior high and I am passing a note to, I won't say her name because she might just tune in, but I am passing a note uh, and I'm asking a question that I've had a little bit of practice asking at this point, and it's, will you be my girlfriend? And I'm still asking people to check a box, yes or no. And an entirely different person, an entirely different phase of my life, I get the note back in seventh period, and instead of the yes being marked or the no being marked, once again, there's a handwritten maybe. So this is where we start to move into the expression of words, understanding even more so that maybe means try again. It doesn't mean give up. It means focus. It means attempt. It means what exactly are you aiming to get out of this situation? Uh, a lot of you know him as Captain James T. Kirk of the Star Trek Enterprise. Other you know him from uh, Emergency 911. Uh, you might even know him from TJ Hooker. But uh, William Shatner, the actor who portrayed a ton of wonderful characters. Uh, I once saw him in a one-man show and he said something that has stuck with me that made sense of all these maybes. Because by that point, I'm thinking maybe actually means no. Maybe actually means you're never going to have a chance and this is never going to happen for you, young man. Uh, but instead, I heard William Shatner at a one-man show. And he said that the biggest gift or the biggest thing he learned about life was when at all possible, always say yes. I don't know you're thinking, well, Ed, yes and maybe doesn't add up, doesn't make sense. But here's where it does. Those maybes equaled yes, if. And that's where we are. And that's where we've been for quite some time. That's where my career has been. Yes, if. Maybe is not a no. A maybe is yes, if. It is the literal embodiment of hope. It is the embodiment of faith. It is the embodiment of perseverance and belief that we're actually going to do something and achieve something better if you move towards that better thing. So would the young lady in eighth grade uh, have went out with me to the dance? Maybe, which means yes, if I in turn show myself to be a young man worthy of her hand. Uh, would the young lady in fourth grade elementary school have uh, sat with me during the lunch break cafeteria and let me give her half of my sandwich, which for the record is the biggest form of love you will ever experience. Uh, the answer was maybe, which means yes, if. I showed that I was worthy of her time. So at this point, I start taking more time out of my life for myself, making sure that I'm taking care of my community, uh, my family, my neighborhood, things that are important to me writing about my surroundings, making sure that I chronicle these events. As I watched in Dayton, Ohio, the system change and move, gentrification begin, and buildings that have been around uh, start to be torn down. I realized that someone needs to chronicle these moments because these are the moments that are going to be held forward. And history should not always be written by the person who won. History should be written by everyone who has a story to tell. So, MHU, what is your story? My question and challenge to everyone is to make sure that you are expressing your story. Do not let anyone ever silence it. We oftentimes hear the, the old idiom and cliche that uh, your life is a movie. You know, what, what is your part? Well, it's your movie. So your part is director, is producer, is writer, is lead actor is grip, is best boy, is assistant director, is cinematographer, is choreographer, set design, landscape, R&D, it's everything. And once I started to realize that, I realized that words were probably the most powerful thing there was. Words stem pandemics. It's the words of a scientist to convince another scientist to check out a chemical formula that makes them realize that a test could actually work. It's words that we used to express on an ongoing basis that literally mean the difference between life and death on a daily basis. So I figured maybe I should start investing myself in these words. Uh, 
Not that money's not a good thing. <laughs> money's wonderful. But money is a social construct. Money comes and goes. But what you say to a person will always be remembered. So we move on. I am now in high school. Uh, fun times. Uh, most of you watching this are greatly remembering the fact that you are in high school. And you are also celebrating the fact that you are no longer in high school. Uh, the thing that you thought you never wanted to leave, now you kind of sort of never want to go back, right? Uh, but uh, during the high school time, uh, another girl and another note. Uh, this time the yes and a no box. And this time she hands it back to me personally. And there's no yes checked and there's no no checked. And I'm looking for the maybe. And it's not on the front of the page, it's not on the back of the page. Uh, this time it was in her eyes. She's looked at me and smiled and gave it back to me and said, give it back another time and we'll see. And you're like, okay, well, that's even weirder. And I don't quite get it. Well, it was actually really simple. This time it taught me the idea of actually connecting with another human being, of realizing that while my words were getting better in high school, uh, my intention was pure and honest, but I was not considering the other person. By simply asking, hey, you want to be my girlfriend, check a box, yes or no. I wasn't asking, how are you? How is your life right now? Is everything okay with you and your family? Is there anything you need? Is there anything I could possibly help you with? I wasn't discussing the other person. Words started teaching me how to see the other person. Uh, to slow down being so judgmental, uh, to quit and take the I need, I want, I must have out of sentences and phrases and make sure that I include the other individual in what should always be a two-way conversation. Even with yourself, if you're smart, you talk to yourself on a daily basis. Uh, my mother said the trick is that she just never answered the questions. Well, my mom was wrong just once in her life and that was it. She'd always answer the questions. So I started asking myself, is this what I need right now? Is this what this person needs right now? Can we get past the wants to the basic needs? We jump forward and we look around 2002, 2004, and there's a SARS outbreak, uh, which sounds kind of familiar to some of you because it's a version of the strain of what we're dealing with right now. And everyone starts running around for masks and being very concerned. Uh, everyone wants to know the source, where it come from, how did it happen. Uh, there's a lot of false information out there as to exactly how things start. Uh, and we notice at that time, everyone is freaking out to the point they don't want to touch or contact or deal with each other, uh, but in a hateful way, in a, a fearful way, in a prejudiced way. Uh, around this time frame, high school is far behind me. <laughs> I'm happy and sad to say. I am, in 2002, uh, taking the hand of a wonderful woman uh, who we both were very young and both very excited to be in love. And uh, we both did not ask a very crucial question. We didn't ask each other what we needed. Uh, we didn't ask what it is that was most important to us. Uh, we had very big stars and hearts in our eyes. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But in the midst of that, at some point in time, we came to the realization that what we both needed, we could not both give to each other in the way we were. So we go our separate ways. And again, you're like, Ed, this is not the whole who am I and tell me about your career and poetry. And I'm very confused at this point. Uh, but relationships are the key to everything. Communication is the key to relationships and words are the key to communication. Uh, what I learned and took away from that experience was you should always make sure that you're heading in the same path. Uh, we do not all share the same journey, even if we all share the same destination. Uh, tons of you that are watching this, faculty and staff, alumni, boosters, supporters, community members, 
uh, all live in the same pocket, all support each other in that Mars Hill pocket. And you all eventually will get to the end of your journey and you'll be in that same pocket with each other. But between where you are now and where that ending is, there are an infinite number of places you'll go. And the only way to ensure that it actually becomes a connection is to actually have those conversations about everyone's intention. So during the SARS outbreak, our intention was stay away from me. Our intention was I don't trust you. Our intention was maybe you have it. Our intention was I can't risk any danger happening to my family or me. So therefore I will not help you if you need it. I learned quickly that the writing of words in Congress bills that are passed, in Senate conversations on floors, uh, I learned quickly that our government leadership, our presidents, uh, who pay people a lot of money to write their speeches, again, using words to motivate and inspire and instill hope in a country or to separate, to segregate, and to build fear and ignorance in a country can mean a lot. Let's move forward past the relationships for a moment. Uh, I go from Edward Pearl Mabry Jr. to Eddie, for those people in my neighborhood at that particular time, to Ed, to Ed Mabry, to now just Ed. Uh, the changing of that word for me meant a lot of different things. Uh, Edward in the Bible means soldier. Uh, I've always been told I should take that to, to heart. And a soldier is someone who is willing to fight and lay down their life for something but it's always the right thing. It taught me to only follow my leadership if my leadership is leading me in a direction that I agree with and think is sound for the entire group. It taught me to put group ahead of self. And that is where we start moving into the words. So I, I lied, one more relationship story. <laughs> I uh, find myself in love with a great individual and she in love with me. And we're together for a period of time and then things don't work out. And uh, I have a lot of things, but one thing I do not have is enough money for therapy. So I decide that I'm going to go to an open mic. Uh, there's a poetry venue not too far from where I live. And I will rush there and I will read the worst poem ever created. Just thank yourself. I'm not sharing this poem right now. The numbers will go down to zero. Everyone will hate it. Uh, the poem was very long. How long is normally what you say at this point? And I'll tell you, the poem was so long, it took me four weeks to read it. I literally would get up every Wednesday for one month and read until the host said, stop, get out of here, you're done for the day. And I'd come back. On the fourth week, I received a standing ovation, which sounds like the start of us discussing my career and part of the SLAM community, right? But no, I received a standing ovation because I started off by saying, this is part four of four just means the last part and everyone clapped because they were very happy that I was going to be done and out of their lives so after a lot of crying a lot of tears a lot of snot on the page a lot of making a fool of myself I leave and tell myself I'll never go back again I've embarrassed myself well enough to where that's never going to happen and uh much like church if you skip a church service uh the closer you get you told yourself you weren't going to go that itch starts to get in you where you're like, ah, I should get up and go. Uh, I found myself through the weekend and going into the next week that, oh, I'm not gonna go, it's Monday, there's no way I'm going back there on Wednesday. I made a fool of myself for a month. I'm never seeing those people again, ever. Uh, Tuesday, there's no way I'm going. Only an idiot, only a crazy person would go back to where they embarrass themselves for a straight month. Wednesday morning, ah, there's no way I'm going. Wednesday night, I am back at the poetry show and I am welcomed with open arms. And the people in the literary community at that time, now Columbus, Ohio, uh, thank me for coming. They appreciate me sharing what I shared on stage. They believe that there is something in me that is special and that I just need to get that out of my system in order to do the actual work I was placed on this planet to do. Um, and that ties us into, again, yes if. So, Maybe if I go to this open mic and share what I think I'm going for is not the overall intention. Maybe, yes, if I'm willing to share of myself, my hurt, my pain, my trauma, 
someone else out there can identify with it and not feel so alone in this world. So maybe, yes, if I come back one more time, I could actually change a life, even if that life is just simply my own. And that's what I learned. And that's literally how my path started on where I am today. Now, if you had told me then, Ed, uh, you're going to go read a really bad poem for four weeks. You're going to cry and embarrass yourself. You're going to go back to an open mic in Columbus, Ohio. And that is going to get you on a stage with the roots or with Joe Scott. Um, that's going to get you being invited by politicians uh, to speak on their behalf. That's going to get you doing introductory speeches when mayors are inducted for uh, taking over office. Uh, that's going to get you your name listed as one of the 50 most important literary voices out of the entire state that you were born in. Um, keeping in mind that that includes such greats as Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, just amazing, Steve Abbott, amazing people. I would have laughed at you, and I probably would have suffered from imposter syndrome and found the quickest way out the door. But what happened was a strange thing. I found a community of people that also enjoyed using words to speak. They also believed that it was our responsibility to use words to make a change on this planet, even if it was just one person. So that does not mean every poem is amazing. It doesn't mean every poem is like the book of Psalms out of the Bible or the Quran. It doesn't mean that every single poem is uplifting and political. I have a poem about how my son farted in the bathtub once because he wanted to make his own bubbles. So trust me, I know good poems and I know not so good poems. But it put me on my path of maybes, the ones that were started uh, by those young ladies all those years ago who had seen something in me I didn't see in myself, uh, by my mother, who when I told her the first time I won, coincidentally, uh, the name of poetry contests around the country are called slams. So it's very uh, serendipitous that I'm here with you guys today. Uh, the first time I told her I won a major slam and I had won like maybe $20, you know, a, a, you know, a coffee mug. Uh, she goes, that's great. Anyway, so, and goes on. A uh, year or so later, mom, I want another poetry slam. These are contests where I read poems. Lots of other people read poems. We get scored by judges. And then in turn, based upon those scores from the judges, they give out placements and rankings. I, I want another one. And this time it wasn't the city level, it was a state level. And I won it. And I got a few bucks, but also it's a state level. And there were, you know, 20 people in it. And she goes, Okay, so anyway, a regional one. Mom, I want a regional one. 50 people this time. A little more money. Uh, a couple offers to actually perform at other places around the, the state. How crazy is that? Okay, so next time you come visit, can you cut the grass? Okay, by this point, I'm thinking maybe this mom isn't my mom. Uh, uh, maybe I was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Adopted. Maybe maybe she was replaced by an android. And she doesn't really care. Uh, but then, so I win a national level. I win a world level poetry slam, the individual world poetry slam. And I'm out of the country when I win it. And I call her and tell her. I won. Out of 72 people that came from all over the planet to compete, I won. A little bit of money, a lot of prestige, a uh, big feather in my hat. She goes, okay. I go, all right, this is it. You're my mom, but you're going to tell me what the world is going on. You don't seem to care. There's something I need to know. Do I owe you five bucks that I do something wrong? And she goes, the next time you come to visit, we'll talk. And I immediately, within a month, I am there. And I'm visiting for the holidays. So, okay, I didn't forget. Let's have that talk, old lady. You know, tell me how come you don't support your only son, your only son. Why don't you care? And she proceeds to pull out a footlocker. In that footlocker are a variety of, of trinkets and keepsakes, things like that. And there's a stack she hands to me. And she says, tell me, what do you see? It says, Edward P. Mabry Jr. Like, okay, when I was a kid, great. Hickory Dale Elementary School in Dayton, Ohio. A speech contest, winner. Poetry contest, winner. Um, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade. Speech contest, winner. Poetry contest, winner talent show, uh, literary arts winner. And I said, I don't remember any of these. And she goes, yeah, that's what kids do. 
kids forget and move on. They have plenty of life to live or so they think. But you did this when you were very young. You used to do speech contests all the time. You got older and moved on, wanted to be a rapper and all these other weird things you want to do when you grow up, right? Uh, so it's not that I'm not impressed, son. It's that I simply am acknowledging you're coming full circle into yourself. You're just coming home. And that's the next part of my career and the next part of discussing with you. You can't escape who you are. And it's best to not try and waste time. What is important is as quickly as possible figuring out who you are. What I learned on my journey to being a creative professional with my focus in the performing arts of poetry is that there was absolutely no problem making mistakes. And don't trust anyone that tells you not to make mistakes. Uh, they are fearful of success. The catch is to never make the same mistake twice. That is the mark of a fool. So always make mistakes. Uh, Bill Gates made tons of mistakes. Every president has made tons of mistakes. Your leadership, your faculty have made tons of mistakes. But what they work on doing is not making the same one twice. Making the same one twice means that you actually might have sort of kind of wanted to make that mistake again. But learning from them has no harm. Every scientist that has worked on the 10 <laughs> pandemics that have happened since my birth to this year made a lot of mistakes, a lot of false trials, a lot of errors, a lot of lives have been lost, a lot of time has been wasted. But it's through those mistakes and the important part of not making the same one twice that has got us a better economy, has got us a better medical care, has got a better healthcare profession and positions in America, has got us where we are now. Uh, writing the poems, the first thing you learn is that your first draft is just that a first draft. No matter how amazing it is, it's a first draft. No matter how great it is, it's a first draft. So in other words, even in poetry, of all the professions I could have picked, uh, I could have worked the drive through the restaurants where all I do is put the food in the bag. So that kills the maybes in my life, right? Um, I could have been a, a planter and just plant seeds in the ground. Now, that's not a great thing, but put the seed in the ground, put water in it, and that eliminates a lot of the maybes. But being a poet, I'm told automatically, no matter how incredible the first thing I create is, it must be edited at some point. So I literally made an effort to pick or was chosen by a path that embodies the idea of maybe, yes if. You've written a poem and it's great, but maybe, yes, if you continue to edit it, if you change this word, if you look at it this way, could you maybe reach one more life? Could you help one more person make it through the day? Maybe if you change the subject matter from this to this, someone will understand their things a little better. Maybe you'll bring some comfort to someone who needs it. You'll give someone permission to shed their tears. So at this point, I learned that winning is fun. And I win a lot of competitions. Uh, by the time it's all said and done, someone told me I've won somewhere over 500, 600 uh, poetry slams in the course of my career. Uh, so they listed me as the winningest or greatest poet in the history of poetry slam, and that was great. Uh, but what got my attention, what got my mother's attention, uh, what made me realize what community I was a part of, beyond my poetry community, uh, I became in a literary community by being nominated for a push cart uh, in which small presses all over the country select the authors and the writers that they've published and said, these are the best ones that we feel voice needs to be added into a push cart book. Those anthologies happen once a year. And it basically adds you to the, the, the lexicon of the American aesthetic when it comes to poetry, the written and spoken word. So to be nominated for that means that someone I'd never met, someone who never saw my face, never heard my voice, simply read my words, had decided that something I had to say was important enough where it needed to be added to the American Library of Congress forever. That'll change your perspective. Hopefully, it'll change how you view the use of words. No matter what your degree will be in, and in spite of everything that's going on, trust me, you're going to end up getting your degree, and you're going to make it through this and move through it. 
you're going to realize that the one thing we take for granted, or two things we take for granted most of all, breathing and our words. We oftentimes do not think of what we say to others. We don't realize you don't have to write a poem to be speaking one. We are all poems, living, breathing poetry. Poems are nothing more than reality viewed from a unique perspective and expressed in a unique way. Human beings are nothing more than unique individuals seeing things in a unique manner and expressing them in a way that's unique to them. We're all simply poems, people. We are pages in a book that is never ending. My challenging question to you is, what will your poem say? When you are long gone, when people speak of you in memories, when people speak of your accomplishments and what you've done for your fellow man, fellow humans, this world and planet overall, what will people say of you? That is the legacy and the interpretation of your poem. So maybe, yes if, maybe, if we all start thinking from that end of things, then maybe we can get past skin tone. Maybe we can get past gender. Maybe we can get past being concerned who you do or don't look like. Maybe, yes, if we all agree that we all are poems, we can get past violence. Because I've seen people do a lot of things, but to imagine, just picture for a moment, someone burning a book of poetry. How more cruel is that? To burn imagination, to burn life, to burn hope, to burn possibilities. We do the same thing if you commit an act of violence. You're hurting a living poem. You wouldn't strangle a tree. And it says so much less than someone watching this now. So to wrap up, we move forward and I could say a lot of cool things, a lot of names. For example, uh, I'm the only four time individual world poetry slam champion. Uh, and based upon math and ratios, I probably will be the only one. I could say that uh, I've toured around the world performing poetry. My poems have been translated into I believe 10 different languages at this point. Uh, shared on continents I have never been to. My poems have been to places I have never been to. Uh, I teach writing workshops where just this week I had people tune in from Kosovo. I had people tune in from India, Australia, New Zealand, uh, just in turn so we could all share poems together and work and edit our yes maybes, our ifs all together at the same time. Uh, I've been on CBS, NBC, uh, TV One, CNN, C-SPAN. I've spoken on behalf of the National Civil Rights Museum. I have been tasked with commission to write poems and compose poems for the Freedom Awards three times, where they felt that the trophy was not enough and they wanted to commemorate it so they have a person write a poem or a speech that's dedicated to the winners that in turn becomes part of the lexicon of the Freedom Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, those names have been people like Jesse Jackson, Pitt Hyde, uh, Joe Biden, Hafsat Abiola, Bernice King, Gloria Steinem, John Legend, uh, people that I never in my wildest dreams of imagined meeting, much less shaking hands, much less having them approach me with tears in their eyes, thanking me uh, for encapsulating their life. Uh, for Gloria Steinem, uh, one of the greatest activists in the history of this planet, uh, to tell me that I'm welcome to her home anytime and she'd love to have a conversation about me because of how I spoke of her. Uh, to have Jesse Jackson shake my hand and tell me that the civil rights movement carries on through my words and it doesn't require me to march or to stand with a fist in the air. It requires me to continue simply doing the job I'm doing. I have said Abiola to thank me about speaking on how her parents have been assassinated. Uh, for Bernice King to thank me for encapsulating her life and the life of her father, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. All of a sudden I go back to that 
note, will you be my girlfriend? Check one box, yes or no. And I realize that my God has always been placing people in my life to challenge me with maybe, with yes if. So in closing, I wanted to challenge you. Feel free to look me up and find out more of my accolades and things I've done. Uh, there's tons of them, national uh, peer academic reviews for USC, uh, I've taught at Georgetown at Harvard, um, Duke workshops, over at this point, 200 colleges and universities around the country, including the wonderful one that you attend or attended or support in some shape, form or fashion or teach or work at. Um, in 2019, uh, APCA, Performance Artist, Spoken Word Artist and Poet of the Year, uh, tons of those. And I don't even keep the trophies anymore, just a little plaque that comes on them. Uh, one, they take up a lot of room. Two, that's not why I did it. And right now, a lot of us are watching this and normally we'd be at Mars Hill together and it'd be very sunny outside and we'd be out in the open or in this wonderful auditorium of performance art space and it'd be a thousand of you packed in and cheers and laughs and clapping and applause and going throughout the day to all the different classes and watching everyone who's put together these incredible exhibits and discussions and performances and we'd watch all that together and we'd spend a great day and we'd laugh but now instead we're all in different rooms and we're all in different spaces and as soon as we walk outside the door, we've got to put a mask over our face uh, because we're being told to do so for our own safety. So we're socially distancing ourselves. The key thing in there I want you to take away from this is socially distancing ourselves. But we are still a community. We are still a nation of one. We are still connected using wonderful models like this that your school has put together in such an excellent way. We are still here with each other. So you are not alone. Wherever you're watching this, I want to repeat, you are not alone. We are all here with you. I know sometimes being against these four walls for an extended period of time can drive you a bit crazy. But you're not alone in that either. As long as we stay clean, as long as we help flatten this curve, all we're doing is when the planet is coming to us, when this silly virus is approaching and challenging us, with saying how many people it's gonna take away from our planet. Our fighting call back is well, maybe, yes, if, yes, if we don't do the things we need to do to take care of ourselves in this planet, then maybe more of us get hurt. But maybe, yes, if, we practice the safe protocols that are in place. Yes, if we make sure that we don't let these moments be the only moments that we're speaking to each other. Yes, if we continue to use Zooms, other conversation platforms, other ways to make sure we go back and forth in conversation communication. Yes, if we understand the power of words, then we will all make it through this. I promise you. Every single person watching this today will make it through the other side of this pandemic. It'll become nothing more than a footnote on a search engine. It'll be a footnote and a note of a speaker for next year that just has something else to say. And we'll look back at this time and we'll remember that it was our endearing hope and love for one another, our communication with each other of realizing that words can be spoken face to face or thousands of miles apart, as I sit here in Los Angeles, California, and you sit wherever you are, and now you realize the power of words. They can fly, they can travel. We are all astronauts. We are all traveling through space and time right in this moment. So my profession is a professional poet. I use words to connect people. It pays my bills and blows my mind every time it does so. And looking back, I could have done a lot of different things and had a lot of love and support. But knowing that everything starts with the spoken and the written word, and that I'm a genesis of having this moment to share with you today, where all of us could come together and speak, I have to be honest with you. I wouldn't pick any other profession. I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ed. Come on. Thank you, Ed. We, I think we, we haven't gotten a lot of questions, and I can tell you it's because people are like weeping and so emotionally touched. You, that was phenomenal. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. And exactly what we need to hear these days, some more than others, some less. Really, really wonderful. We truly appreciate it. We are going to try and see if we can get some questions. I actually have one. Um, okay. What, um, who, or who, how many people, who in your life do you think influenced you the most with regard to your career? Mm. And not the most necessarily, but who are different people that have influenced you? Because, you know, we oh. all have different influences in our lives. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've just said it. Poetry, okay, that's unique. Let's, let's make a job out of being a poet. So cool. And you have done an amazing job. But what, beyond the stories that you've told, who, who kind of supported you in that? Uh, other poets. Um, it's, it's a very weird, again, it's a very weird thing because it didn't exist, like it doesn't exist, right? It doesn't, uh, when you click on ethnicities, is there, if you select job titles, you can scroll through a government listing, you won't find poet. Um, so I do a lot more educational work as well, going into schools and working. Uh, but in terms of support, uh, my mother, in her own way of the yes, whatever, you know, that's, that's how she challenges me to push out the nest. Um, a lot of people, there are a lot of silent, um, like angel investors on a non-financial scale. A lot of people are the people that recommend me for things uh, that I never would know of. Um, the National Civil Rights Museum contacted me to be part of the Freedom Award, part of a poetry event, because someone there in their local community had heard of me and said it'd be great to get them here. And then that formed that relationship. That relationship formed uh, writing speeches and poems for them. And in turn, they said, well, hey, if you do this, can you come over here for this? And that equaled me speaking at the MLK 50th commemoration of his assassination. And then that turned into being on C-SPAN and CNN. And then Paramount Studios, Studios contacted me and said, can't be on this. Um, a person who saw me perform in DC became a curator for an arts event. And then said, we have to get this guy in. That in turn equaled getting on uh, TV three times and Emmy nomination and NAACP Image Award nomination uh, from that. So as, as pinpointing one individual, there, there are some people who, who've done personal things for me, but in terms of actually uh, pushing my, my life forward or pushing my career forward, it's been these, I, I literally call them my, my angel investors. Uh, people pop up. This conversation, this event, uh, being here, being part of this, uh, spawned from uh, my work with Mars Hill uh, on a, a smaller but no less important scale, right? Um, yeah, so it's been that kind of thing where someone said, hey, you should consider him to be a keynote speaker and his life is very interesting and uh, his profession and trajectory and how that happened is very interesting. Uh, and to be a successful person, I've worked for myself and owned myself as a business performing and touring colleges and venues, et cetera, uh, for about 12 years now. Uh, so that makes it a full blown career, like I am me incorporated. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's no one person aside from my mom, uh, but all of you, you, you know, the conversations we've had, your patience and kindness with me, um, everything, all these things have been like the contributing forces. Okay. Um, we've got a really interesting one, and I'm reading to the side here, so just ignore the way I look. What is no your favorite word or the word that you feel contains the most power regardless of context? Say that one more time. What is your favorite word or the word that you feel contains the most power regardless of context? Uh, the word. Okay, there's two. Uh, yes. Um, I think it's the most powerful word. And my personal one is Goober, but that's a whole different reason because uh, I like the universality of Goober. I can call anyone I know a Goober and it means a million different things depending on who you are. Uh, so that's my personal one. Uh, but yes, I think yes would be. Um, yeah, because it, it, it opens, yes, open, yes can open and close doors. No can only close them, right? I really liked your comment from William Shatner, when it all possible, I always say yes. That's, that's a mindset, and that, I really enjoy that. Okay, another question. One special thing you'd like the new normal to look like that's different from before? Ooh, that's a great question, and a lot of us, a lot of everyone has had this conversation, right? Um, I would like, oh God, I, there's so, I, I, that's, that'd be a whole other 40 minutes. I would like uh, for businesses to take their communities in mind. Um, I would like for everyone to not, if we just thought on a local scale, 
I know that sounds counterintuitive. Um, instead of think on a global scale, if we thought on a local scale, in other words, if I make sure I'm doing everything to keep my house in order, metaphorically and literally, uh, and then in turn, my neighbor does the same, my neighbor does the same, then our block is in order. Then we can extend our concern to our two blocks, to our neighborhood, to our community, to our city, to our state. Um, I would like to see um, ecology become important again, uh, forestation become important again. I would like for cars to be reduced. Uh, here in LA, they've been discussing so much how the smog is lifted and I can literally look out my window and I can see mountains that were not there when I moved here a year ago. They weren't there, like they were there, but I could not see them. I can see all the way to the observatory from my window uh, that I just simply could not see. And the idea that we hit the play button again, and then within a month, everything goes back to the level of noise and rush. Um, I would like to see more people consider the elderly. Uh, right now across the country, a lot of grocery stores are having special hours for senior citizens to go and shop. They can shop any time of the day, but a certain time of the day, it's only them. I would like to see that extended to uh, healthcare workers, um, to teachers who have to get up early in the morning, uh, to single parents. Um, I would love to see us do some of the consideration things we're doing now, then, uh, and not because a governor or a mayor or your president said so, but because it's the right thing to do. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, here's one. What's the greatest piece that you have written or spoken in your career? Uh, they're okay. gonna hate my answer. Uh, <laughs> it's twofold. The greatest piece for me is always the next piece. Um, it's always the next challenge, which you know sounds very corny and poet-like. Uh, so I always come up at my default answer is uh, I stole a poem from my son, and it's the greatest piece I ever wrote because he wasn't old enough to write yet. He could sing it, he couldn't write it. So it goes as follows. It's very very short. Uh, we walk like ducks. We waddle waddle waddle. All we want to do is just swim in the puddle. Swim in the puddle till the sun goes down and quack, 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 because that's our sound. Uh, he made it up one day walking home and I stole it. <laughs> and I've used it at a variety of shows because he is no longer that age. He actually just got married uh, and he's not received a dime of royalties from it. Uh, so that's the best piece I ever transcribed uh, would be that piece. Yeah, it says everything I think you need to know about life is in that short poem. Nice. All right, do you have any advice for students who are going into the arts and are facing criticism and skepticism from friends and family who don't really think that's a viable career? Uh, that's a loaded question. You're trying to make your mom and dad send me very, very mean emails. Um, <laughs> I will say this. I will, okay, geez, that's not fair. <laughs> um, I will say this. I will say if you are in school now pursuing a particular degree that is not in the performing arts or creative arts, uh, I would recommend ha having that, okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to contradict myself, having that's an important thing. Having that cushion is a great thing. Uh, there's nothing wrong. You can be a poet and a lawyer. Um, I know uh, not everybody should be a full-time poet. There's only 1% of us, of all the poets in the country, 1% of the top 1% can do this professionally and make a living. So I don't recommend jumping into being, oh, I'm going to be a poet because I saw Ed. Eh, we'll have a conversation about that. Um, so have, having, a, having a fallback is a great thing, right? Um, however, uh, the other option is the wonderful Denzel Washington said when they asked him what contributed most to his success is that he didn't have a plan B. Uh, it forced him to put all his focus on plan A. So uh, my, ah, that's so awkward. Uh, I want you to get whatever degree you're pursuing. I don't want your parents finding me one day on the street and just punching me in the nose. And I wonder what happened in the grocery store. And like, you told my child to not be a doctor. Uh, so please go be a doctor. But uh, also follow your heart. One thing, and then I'll, I'll shut up and let you go to the next question. One thing I, were, I think we're learning during this pandemic, uh, with a lot of companies and businesses shutting down, with schools being forced, unfortunately, to close their doors early. Not all schools, Mars Hill will, but not all schools are going to open their doors back up. Um, not all students are going to get to complete their degrees, but I have student loans, et cetera. So then I've heard a lot of people talking about, had I known this, I would have pursued that. Had I known this would happen, I would have pursued that job or that career. So what I would challenge you is, it's not so much the degree portion as it is, make sure you're pursuing something that's going to fill and feed your heart and feed your spirit. So therefore, if there's money or no money involved, like if I wasn't getting paid for it, I'd still go to poetry events and I'd still write poems. 
I would still try to sell books. You know, I would still be doing those things. So make sure whatever it is is going to feed your spirit. Because if it feeds your spirit, then it edifies you. If it edifies you, you can edify others. But if it doesn't feed you, you're not really going to feed others, no matter how good you are at your job. Your faculty, Joy, and everyone else, what they do for a living feeds their soul. And that's how they're able to feed others. Thank you. I am getting multiple requests for a short piece of your poetry, for you to speak a short piece. Short. Uh, uh, <laughs> Other than the duck waddling. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll just, I'll just be called to the duck one. <laughs> Uh, okay, a very, very short one. Um, a very, a, a short piece of, a piece of a short piece. Uh, um, there is a revolution, and it is not black power nor white power. It is not scary nor tyrannical. It is not Hitler nor Gandhi, Malcolm nor Martin, Osama nor Noriega. It is a young couple's kiss behind some high school bleachers. It's an old couple holding hands in a mall. It is loving someone intensely for five minutes and then letting them go when the song ends. It is your misfiring synapses. It is your heartbeat that still keeps beating like a drummer boy, even on days you don't want to get up that tells you to get up, like it is hell bent on getting through its spiritual desert. It is writing a poem or hearing one. Matter of fact, real revolution is simply as simple as a inhale or a exhale. If you uh, take a look at anyone you see during the course of your day, uh, take a look closer, actually make eye contact, which we don't do much anymore, and you'll see the battle being fought in their eyes and recognize it's just a reflection of the same war being fought inside you. And that's the effort to live your life the way you wish every moment of every day. And that Mars Hill is a real battle. And if you learn how to win that, then that is what we call real revolution. So no matter what else you got from my speech earlier, make sure that you leave this entire event and watch and check into everything today. But walk away, reminding yourself to learn how to just inhale and how to just exhale, how to just live and how to just let other people live. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. One last question. Sure. And this is interesting. How would you use words or language to change a no person to a yes, maybe person for their own benefit? Wow, that's, oh, Jesus. Uh, that's an incredibly deep question. I know. Um, how do you turn a no person to a yes or a maybe person? Uh, assuming that it's a positive thing we're trying to convince them to do. Right. <laughs> where, 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 but the question, like, you know, how do I get them to say, they don't want to be with me, I want to make them be with me. Yeah, don't tell them Ed said anything. Um, turn a no into a maybe or yes is by simply thinking from the person's point of view. Uh, we normally say no because either something is going to be harmful to us or not beneficial to us, right? So if it's not harmful to me, then show me the benefit. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll hear almost anything you have to say. Um, whether I want it or need it, need it or want it. So that requires you, the person asking or, or trying to get it to happen, to take yourself out of your shoes and put yourself in another person's shoes. What does this person need? What does this person want? Uh, what is this person, what are their, their needs, wants, goals, what's gonna make them happy, their aspirations? And is the thing that I'm asking them to do, to partake in whatever the case is, something that's going to edify and feed that? And then you know whether or not you should be trying to convince them otherwise or no. Fantastic advice. Ed, we cannot thank you enough. This has been absolutely amazing. We've got just a little bit more, so hang with us. Um, if you give a thumbs up, some people are doing snap, snap, snap. If you, you know, I don't know if you can see all those different things, but thumbs up for everybody for Ed. We can't hear anything else. But yeah, so yeah, the comments down here. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. I, yeah, I see some of the comments are popping up. I had to keep, make sure I look up the folks that okay. keep looking down. I don't actually say what someone said in the middle of, a, middle of the speech. And <laughs> like, what is he talking about? Yeah, but thank you guys very, very much. Um, Please keep in contact. All my social media is just my name. It's just Ed Mabry. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. Uh, if you ever need anything, reach out. Feel free to do so. Uh, please also check out everything else that they're doing today. Um, it's a really incredible event. I'm very sorry that I won't be able to physically. I was looking forward to spending a whole day going from space to space because the lineup was just so, so, so amazing. Uh, so, so amazing. Um, thank you to everyone for saying thank you. Yeah, by all means, please follow me. Uh, uh, Facebook is probably my artist page is the best option or Instagram. The other Facebooks are just weird. They get full and, you know, time and life and all that jazz. Um, yeah, but just everything's my name, the way it's spelled. I'm really easy, easy to find. So I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you.